I would like to ask all of you to come a bit more to the front, so show some love to our next speakers. It's going to be a really exciting talk about a really exciting research on flip feng shui. Um, please welcome Victor von der Veen and Kave Rasavi from the FUSEC research group that was doing research in, 2007, uh, in 2016 into um, the raw hammer exploitation and they managed with the flip feng shui technique uh, to actually re reliably exploit that hardware bug. So, enjoy. Wow. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Victor. This is Gave. Um, we're from Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. And we're going to talk about um, Rohammer and Flip Feng Shui. Uh, feng Shui. Research we did last year in 2016 uh, with our research group. So, who are we? Well, that's me over there. Uh, Gave is next to me. Uh, other people who were involved in this research were uh, our professor. Oh, that doesn't work. He's in the middle. Uh, this is Herbert Bus. He's the boss of the group. That's why he's called Herbert Bus. Uh, next to him, there's Cristiano. And then over here, there's uh, uh, Ben, who was also involved. And it's Eric. No, Eric is not on his picture, but I think he should be here in the room. Is he here in the room, Eric? No, he's not here yet. Uh, but he was also involved. Um, we do a lot of stuff. This will be about this talk will be about hardware vulnerabilities, but we also do uh, interesting uh, top, uh, research on the other topics that are here. So mobile security, some binary uh, armoring. We do some malware analysis. So we were involved in taking down uh, the game over Zeus botnet uh, collaboration with the FBI a couple of years ago. Um, we also do software testing, which means we do uh, fuzzing. We write fuzzers and many more interesting stuff. Um, but today it will be about Flip Feng Shui. And basically, your takeaway message of today, so after this you can fall asleep or move to another talk, uh, is the following. Uh, even, if, even if we can build perfect software without any bug, any bug whatsoever, um, a single hardware issue, a single bit flip in your hardware, can still compromise it. All right, so Philip Feng Shui, in 2016, um, our research from our group, we show that um, with single bit flips, um, we can turn these bit flips into a reliable comp uh, compromise of the cloud, which was done in this work here. Um, we can break the browser using bit flips, which was shown by Eric and the DDoP uh, paper. And we can also use bit flips to uh, break your mobile phone. And we're going to talk about all three of these today. And since we are in the Netherlands, I wanted to express that these are all uh, research papers that have been published at, published at top venues in computer security. And they're Dutch, right? So I think it's something to, something to be proud of. Thank you. Actually, in 2016, we were the best research group in security. Uh, and we were better than MIT, which I, I think. <laughs> All right. OK, so a bit more uh, uh, arrogance, I guess. Uh, we had a world at impact. We were covered by many news all over the world. Um, well, yeah, OK. Introduction. Um, flip Feng Shui, the requirements. What do you need if you want to do a Flip Feng Shui attack? First, you need is a re reproducible hardware bit flip. We're going to use Rohammer for that. I'll talk about it in a minute. And then next is the ability to target this bit flip um, so that you can actually flip a bit in something that's interesting. Um, so about Rohammer, who here, I want to see hands, who here is familiar with Rohammer? So that means there are still some people that are not familiar with Rohammer, which is good, um, because I'm going to explain it. I'm going to talk about single-sided Rohammer. Uh, imagine your DRAM is like this. Uh, this matrix of capacitors storing ones or zeros. Um, oh, this is hard to see. But people found that if you're going to read from one of these rows in your memory, and then read something else, and then read from the row again, many, many times, 
you will see at some point, uh, if you do it enough, a bit flipping and that is next to one of these rows, that's adjacent to these rows. Um, we call these rows that we're reading from, we call these the aggressor rows, and the rows uh, in which we can flip a bit is the victim row. Now, it's important to mention that um, Rawhammer does not allow you to flip every bit. Sometimes with DRAM, maybe um, not vulnerable enough, so you can not flip anything. Um, but people found that once you flip a bit with Rawhammer, you can actually reproduce it. So once you know that this particular red cell there over there is vulnerable uh, for Rohammer, you can store, try to store some important data there and then reproduce this to flip a bit. Um, then people found that, well, single-sided single Rohammer is nice, but you can actually increase your chances of flipping a bit if you're going to sandwich this victim row by reading from two aggressor rows uh, in an alternating fashion. OK. So if you're an attacker and you want to do this, there are a few challenges. So first thing you need to do is you need to bypass the CPU cache. Um, as probably most of you know, if you're reading something from your DRAM memory, the CPU is going to read something from your DRAM memory, it's going to get stored in the cache. And we're going to repeatedly read the same row from DRAM. Um, your system is not stupid. It will basically serve everything from the cache. So we need a way to tell the cache to, after we read one of these rows into it, to remove it, to flush it from the cache. Actually, and there is an instruction for that uh, on Intel, um, which basically does this. You, you give it an address, and then it will remove it from the, from the cache. Um, another way of getting your data out of the cache is simply to read more until your cache is full, and at some point it will evict uh, the address that we are interested in. And then next time you read it, the read will go to your DRAM. OK. So the mechanics now of a flipping shoey attack is first do memory templating. And with memory templating, we mean uh, scanning your memory, the entire memory, or whatever you can get for bit flips um, that are useful for your attack. The second step then is to land sensitive data, so something that you can actually exploit into this region, the page, the cell, um, where you can flip a bit. And then you reproduce the bit flip, and basically, you're done. All right. And now, Kave is going to talk about his work that he presented at Usenix about hammering a needle in the software stack. Thanks, Victor. All right. So these three steps that uh, Victor uh, just talked about, uh, we're going to, like, show three examples of how we could use these steps to compromise uh, different systems in different settings. So the first one is uh, using this primitive to compromise a VM in the cloud. So imagine that you're an attacker and you want to compromise somebody's VMs. Then you have to start a VM somewhere uh, that is close in the same physical machine as the, as the victim. And then uh, your goal is that to flip a bit somewhere in the memory of this uh, victim VM so that you could compromise it. Uh, so this is all like the assumptions of the attack. Uh, so that uh, you basically want to use Rawhammer. And uh, another feature is called memory deduplication to make the attack possible. So memory deduplication is this feature that some providers use uh, in order to reduce the memory fit, uh, footprint of their VMs. So you have lots of VMs running in the cloud. And you know, most of them are running Windows or Linux, the same software stack. And you want to so like, um, reduce the footprint by making sure that they don't store the same copies in memory. Um, and the idea is that you can, using this primitive, this flip feng shui primitive, you can flip a bit uh, in the, a memory that is being used by another VM. So I have a question for you. So just for those who haven't uh, heard about this before, I wanted to think, if you could flip a bit in a VM, one bit, what bit would you flip? so that uh, you could compromise. So the, your goal is to compromise uh, this VM, uh, this victim VM, and you, and you can do this by flipping one bit. So I wanted to think, what would you flip? Um, huh? Maybe that could be. So we can, we can discuss this like, uh, after, so what we chose and what is possible and what is not. Um, so you start by uh, templating. So the first step, as Victor said, is memory templating. How would you template memory? 
So because you are running on the same physical host as your victim, you, can, uh, you have access to the same physical memory. Um, and the thing is that, as Victor said, you need to be able to flush the cache because to, for Rohammer to happen, you have to read from memory really quickly. And uh, for this, since you're root in your own VM, you can use this instruction that Intel provides. It's called cache flush that uh, would help you to flush the cache and then you can access, use it to access your own memory really, really quickly. So what, what the victim does, basically allocates a large physical contiguous buffer and uses the cache flush instruction to read from memory. So you start reading, you check, no flip, you do a bit more, still no flip, and then suddenly you get a bit flip in your own memory, right? But this is in your own memory, right? You're a victim VM. So how would you use this uh, to sort of like flip a bit in a victim VM? Um, and this is where the sort of like the deduplication part of uh, the attack comes into play. So we want to force our victim to store some sensitive data uh, in this location that has a bit flip that once we trigger this bit flip, it allows us to do uh, a compromise. So that, that's what we said. We use memory duplication for this. And the way it works is that, so typically you have like your victim VM and your attacker VM. Typically they have uh, some data. Uh, some of these data are different, like you know, if you have a pointer in memory, potentially in your memory page, uh, this pointer is different between two VMs, and this is not something that you can do duplicate. But some data, for example here, like this one, these two, are the same. So you could, uh, as a hypervisor, as a cloud provider, you could just somehow like, store only one copy that would, uh, that would uh, save you one page. And you do this for many pages, and suddenly, instead of you know, only being able to run 10 VMs, you can run 100 VMs. This is quite good, right? Because it allows you to make more money by running more and more VMs. So yeah, so there is a process that, that goes on in the background and it scans for these uh, sort of like pages. And as soon as it finds, it finds the same copy, it basically updates the, the page tables, the pointer that the VMs use uh, to point to this physical page. So now we come back to the question of what would you flip? So we, we talked quite a lot about this, and uh, so one of the so like things that uh, the so like we we came up with that would allow us to use this. Remember that this is one bit flip, right? So and uh, you have to make sure that the data that you want to corrupt is exactly at that location. So and then you have like 32,000 uh, possibilities for a bit flip within a four kilobyte page, which is the unit that the system uses to do memory duplication and also paging. So we thought about this, what could we flip quite easily? And one of the things that came up was um, um, cryptographic keys. So imagine, like, for example, you have an uh, RSA key stored in your VM. And then this is like, imagine if you have a 4 kilobyte, uh, so if you have an RSA 4,000 bits, it, it spans quite a bit of uh, a memory page. So these are like all potentials that you could use to flip a bit in an, uh, in an RSA key. And the other option would be a domain name. So, and we have two attacks that I'm going to discuss how we use this sort of bit flipping in these things to compromise this victim VM. All right, so let's talk about how we use this to uh, do the compromise uh, using the, uh, these bit flips to compromise OpenSSH. So how many of you know about authorized keys? I hope many people. Yeah, this is something that we all use, right? So it makes it much easier. We don't, we don't have to enter our passwords all the time. So there is this file uh, in your home folder. Uh, that you could store your public key there, and, um, and then from then on, by showing the private key and doing a challenge and response with the OpenSSH server, you can just log in. Um, and one of the properties of uh, this authorized keys file is that, so basically the stuff, so the public key that you store in there is that the attacker, an attacker would not be able to guess this, so this public key is made out of two prime numbers, and the, and these two prime numbers that are multiplied together, and it's, it's, it's a hard problem to factorize these two. So once you can factorize this, these two numbers, then you can easily like, generate a private key and then use it to log in. Right, so we target this thing, this public key, and this is usually on disk, but as soon as you start a SSH connection, the open SSH server reads these files and brings it to memory. And memory is something that you can't trust anymore because you can flip bits uh, in the memory. Uh, so typically, as I said, it's quite hard to factorize this, these two numbers. But once you do a bit flip, it suddenly becomes uh, much, much easier to factorize this. So instead of being two prime, once you do corrupt this uh, sort of like RSA key, 
suddenly it becomes a multiplication of many primes, which makes it much, much easier to factorize it. Uh, so typically, like this factorization is shown to take, you know, hundreds, maybe if not hundreds of thousands of years to actually factorize a 4K RSA key. But once you do this bit flip, uh, as we show our, in our paper, it actually suddenly becomes like a matter of seconds or even minutes to actually factorize it to all its uh, uh, building blocks, building numbers, prime numbers. And once you have that, you could easily SSH to the victim VM. Um, now you could say, so this is, this is a nice attack, so we actually executed this, and then we showed that it could compromise the victim VM. But one problem with it that you might say is that it's not a zero-knowledge attack, right? So you need to know the public key of your VM. I mean, uh, your, your victim VM. There is GitHub, so if you know, okay, this is the so like admin that is using this VM, you could go through GitHub that automatically uploads your public key. So there are like some ways to get this. But wouldn't it be nice if we could compromise the VM without knowing anything about it? And this is what the second attack is about. So we use uh, the bit flipping to, uh, in, in two rounds, we use the flip feng shui in two rounds. So the first round to flip a bit in the domain name, and then the second round uh, in a cryptographic key to sort of like make this compromise happen. So typically when you do like an update update, right, there is this file uh, that uh, sources that list that uh, holds a list of these domain names, right, that uh, your updates are coming from like ubuntu.com, or if you're using Debian, debian.com. There is also on Windows and Android, there are these URLs that, uh, that people use to uh, basically fetch their updates. And once you do a bit flip in this file, suddenly your ubuntu.com becomes something like ubuntu.com, for example. And, uh, and then the victim is going to go to this um, website and get the packages from there. Um, but we, we should be good, right? Because these packages are signed. So people have thought about this. People have been doing lots of these network attacks to make sure that your VM or your system goes to a malicious repository to download the packages. So they said, OK, how can we fix this? We do end-to-end -end cryptography, right? We sign the packages. And then once the packages are signed, uh, there shouldn't be any way for the victim can check this. And then it wouldn't install these packages once it knows that uh, the, the signatures don't match, right? Um, but fortunately, uh, we could do a bit flip in the GPG key that the victim uses to verify these packages. So this is the same. It's the same as RSA. So once we do a bit flip in there, uh, we could, uh, again, calculate all these prime numbers, and then we could use it to sign the packages. So in the first step, we flip a bit in the victim's VM to go to our repository. In the second stage, we flip a bit in the, uh, so like this file, so that the package, the malicious package that, uh, that we want the victim to install, like, for example, a new OpenSSH or core utils or whatever that we want to backdoor, we use those private key, this new private key, to, to sign it so that the victim would trust it and install it the way we wanted to. So we did all of this, and this attack also worked. And so we were a bit worried, so we wanted to make sure that um, yeah, nobody is harmed by this attack, so we contacted NCSC. And they did a really, really good job of disclosing these issues. Because this is some issue that uh, like affects all the layers of the stack. It affects your DRAM. It affects your, uh, your operating system. Uh, potentially, could be uh, like, uh, affected by this. Your uh, cryptographic library, open GPG or SSH, could be affected by this. So uh, we contacted those to sort of like make sure that uh, they would uh, do something about it. We also bought all of these domains so that people could not do uh, an attack anymore using these domains. And we gave this to, um, so like uh, at, at some point, Interpol took over, and now the, the domains are basically uh, handled by, by them so that people would not be able to use, abuse these domains to do a Philip Feng Shui attack in VMs. And it was also nominated uh, for a Pony, uh, the best cryptographic attack. But we were up against uh, Shattered, which is, uh, I think, like much more uh, impactful. So we didn't actually, so Shattered got the, the award. Um, so this was the example that we used Philip Feng Shui to compromise cloud VMs. Um, now we also used the same principle to compromise uh, the browser. Uh, so the attack is called Dedup S Machina. And uh, the, the point that Dedup S Machina wants to make is that you could compromise a browser end-to-end -end without any software vulnerabilities. So you go to a website, and then uh, you use uh, sort of like um, a side channel attack, which I'm not going to talk about uh, today, but I'm going to use the information that it provides to basically leak some pointers. And then we use the leaked pointers to do a flip feng, feng shui attack to corrupt these pointers to sort of like um, compromise the browser. So and 
none of these things, there is no bug in Edge. But using this Plifeng tree primitive and the dedupe uh, side channel, we could basically compromise the browser. And we do this all from JavaScript, which sort of shows like this is actually quite, uh, quite dangerous. So, and I'm going to, again, go through the three steps of how the attacker uh, would go through uh, to be able to compromise the browser using the flip fang tree primitives. So, um, in the first stage, we have to find bit flips, right? We have to template the memory to find which locations in memory are vulnerable to raw hammer. And um, in the previous example, it was quite easy, right? We, we, we could just use cache flush instruction, but in JavaScript, we are quite limited, right? We don't even have like virtual addresses, right? Everything is uh, sort of like in this high level JavaScript language. So, we can do easy cache flushing. But instead, you could easily read a bunch of other lo location in memory that would flush the, the, the cache at the location that you want to hammer. So you go on and access some other location in memory, uh, and then you access your target. And then this would allow you to, to sort of like trigger the bit flips to do the templating part. Um, so and your, our target is a JavaScript array. So I don't know how many of you know uh, do programming in JavaScript, but typically you have a normal array in JavaScript that allows you to store all kinds of things in there, like you could store like a double in there, you could store a pointer reference in there, you could store many things in there. But accesses to these arrays are slow because it needs to figure out, okay, is this object that is currently being referenced uh, a pointer or an integer? So there are some checks involved there. But there is also this other type, which is much, much faster, and these are called the typed arrays, which the type is known, so it's an integer or a double, uh, sorry, a short, and then since it doesn't need to do checks there, accesses are quite fast. And fast is good for us, right? So we want to be able to read from memory really, really, really quickly. So we use these typed arrays uh, to sort of like do the, uh, the, do the ev eviction and hammering, and then we want to target a, a JavaScript array. So here I've used some colors. So the red colors are the location that map to the same location, same ca uh, location in the cache. So if you read from those, then uh, in the JavaScript array, that would flush the location that this uh, JavaScript array at the location red is, uh, is located. So by reading from these uh, uh, red parts, we can sort of like read from memory that is uh, located at location uh, red in the JavaScript array. So this is like how we use the eviction buffer to read from memory instead of reading from the cache. Um, so then this is like how the templating works. And uh, so the other problem, as Victor mentioned, we need to know the sort of like location of uh, uh, the, the object that we are reading in memory. But in JavaScript, as I said, we don't have any, right, anything, right? We don't know the virtual addresses, let alone the physical. Uh, we don't know the physical address, let alone the, the virtual addresses. So we can't really do uh, double-sided uh, there because we don't know the, uh, the, the addresses. But there are like some other crazy side channels that Eric came up with, like using the so like how uh, memory uh, basically is laid out. So depending on how you're reading from it, things become faster or slower. And uh, so by using this information, he crafted this access pattern that allows you to do double-sided row hammering, uh, so sort of like probabilistically. And uh, he managed that you could actually get bit flips from JavaScript without having any information, which is, uh, which is really, really interesting. So if, you're, if you want to know more about this, I, uh, I can refer you to our paper, which discusses these things. And then this allows you to get a bit flips from JavaScript. Um, so this is so like how the attack uh, works. So here you have your JavaScript array, and this this has like a uh, so like a, an object there that points into memory. So and this is like so our target is so like this this pointer, this reference that is pointing to a typed array, and. Uh, Typically, what you have when you have a typed array uh, in, in JavaScript, what it has is a vtable pointer and a size. So the vtable pointer defines the functions that you could use on this array. So in terms of like, tell me what your size is. Can I get an uh, like so like uh, an object? Can I do a, something on this location and like other type of functions? So all the functions that you could do on this type thing is defined by this vtable pointer. And it has a size that defines the size of this, this array. And then, then your data will come after this size. So we, we take this typed array, and then using the side channel, which gives us two pointers, we create this counterfeit object in the data area of this, this typed array. So now you have a vtable pointer, a size, uh, and there. But we don't have, it's a counterfeit object, right? We don't have any reference to it. So it's not really useful. We can't use this to do anything. But given our uh, raw hammer, we just Start reading from memory really quickly, right? So that's how Rohammer works. And at some point, we trigger this bit flip. And 
This bit flip causes this pointer to this typed array to suddenly start pointing to our counterfeit object. And once we have a uh, sort of like a reference to our counterfeit object, we can do some, some things. Uh, because we control the size of this, imagine, uh, remember that this is something that we put in there, right? So we could control the size of the object uh, that we have put in there. So since we can put a really, really, really large size, and this point, at this point, it gives us arbitrary read and write over the memory. So in JavaScript, you're not allowed to read beyond your object, right? So that's sort of like the whole point of uh, sandboxing, right? But with this sort of like uh, primitive and this attack, it, we can easily read beyond our object. And suddenly, we have arbitrary read and write in the memory. And from there on, we could do uh, control diversion attacks and like escalate the privileges. We can start like doing other kinds of attacks. So it allows us to take over edge. Um, without a software bug. So we were talking with Microsoft about this, and uh, to sort of like make sure that the users of uh, Windows and Edge are protected against this attack. And then uh, Microsoft decided that they're going to disable memory deduplication starting July last year, so that people could, would not be able to do the dedupe as machina attack. And uh, yeah, so people liked this quite a lot. Also, the hacker community liked it quite a lot. So, and then in 2016, uh, in Las Vegas, uh, Eric won the most innovative research pony uh, for this for this attack, and yeah, so that's uh, that's it. So now I'm going to give it back to Victor, and Victor is going to tell you how we use Flip Fang Shui uh, to compromise mobile phones in your pocket. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hello again. Uh, so this last uh, scenario of the talk will be about, will be about Dremor. It was really a collaboration between uh, VU and then people in Austria and also uh, people in Santa Barbara where I was when I did this work. <clears throat> it also got published at a very good uh, conference last year. And um, basically, the question that I had after I saw uh, Ben and Kave breaking the internet, I, I figured, can we use, uh, then can we maybe do Rowhammer on Android and then use it to root uh, an Android phone? Um, However, if you're going to look at this, then you will realize soon that uh, Android phones are usually different than uh, the stuff they were working on before, because you have suddenly ARM, which is a completely different chipset than Intel. Uh, also, Android devices, uh, turns out that they don't have any kind of memory deduplication, so the stuff that they did before, we couldn't do. Um, however, we still managed to pull this off by exploiting the behavior of the underlying memory allocator um, in your operating system. But let's start with the first phase again, memory templating. So um, we need to bypass the CPU cache. Now recall on x86, we can either do this with cache eviction, as in DDoP at Machina, or with the explicit cache flush instruction. Um, and my first job was now to flip a bit on ARM. So does this work on ARM? Well, of course not, uh, because why would you make things simple, right? Uh, and it turned out that this cache eviction was uh, too slow, so I couldn't uh, I, I implemented it, but it was not fast enough to flip anything. And then the explicit cache flush instruction, it's privileged. So if you are a normal app uh, on Android, you cannot flush anything from your DRAM. Um, so we had to do uh, something else, right? And then um, we found that this cache that the CPU is using sometimes is not something you want there. Because if you have other uh, components, for example, an audio driver or a GPU. Um, it might want to work on the same DRAM that your CPU is looking at. And in this case, um, you don't want your GPU to look at something that is different than the CPU is looking at. So whenever you have a setup like this, um, there's some kind of need for direct memory access in which the cache is disabled, uh, DMA. Um, so we could use DMA, actually, to get uh, uncached memory. Um, and then landing sensitive data. So let's look at the threat model that we had in mind. Um, we were assuming a recent Android operating system um, without memory deduplication, because it's too costly on mobile phones. It will drain your battery too fast. And we have an unprivileged app that wants to get root access. Now, if you want to get root access, basically what you want is read-write access to anywhere in memory. Because if you have that, then you can find anything in the kernel that's interesting and then change anything there. Uh, and we were actually going to use this to override their own user ID that would say this app has only this limited set of privileges. And we override it to zero, and then we would get root. So the goal is read-write access. 
And the approach for this is that we were going to uh, land a page table at the location in memory that is vulnerable to Rowhammer. And then once we have that there, we're going to flip a bit in it. And I will explain you now how that works. So page tables. Um, page tables are a simple concept that are mapping virtual addresses to physical addresses. Another example, if you have a user-space program and you allocate some buffer, you get some virtual addresses. Uh, but if you then look at your physical memory, um, the, the mapping from the, the, your software, from your virtual addresses, to uh, physical addresses, it's nonlinear. Could be any, could be anything. So in this case, the beginning of your buffer is pointing uh, further down in memory than the second part of your buffer. And a page table is this thing that will. Well, this see what it says. It it translates virtual addresses to physical addresses. So there is this uh, structure somewhere in your memory um, where there will be a virtual address, and then it will say, oh yeah, this virtual address b six a blah blah is stored as this physical address. I also added the binary representation here um, because we'll need that in a minute. So where are page tables stored? I just said it in memory. For example, there, in, your, in between your buffer. Um, and then what happens if we flip a bit in the page table? So I'm going to flip a bit right there. Oh, yeah, we're going, we're going to modify map ins. So now it should be, yes. So I'm, I'm looking at this particular bit over there, which is the, the, the first mapping, the first virtual address uh, pointing to hello in physical memory. I'm going to flip that 1 into a 0. What will happen then with the actual physical errors? It will change from 1, 4, 0, 0 to 1, 0, 0, 0. Now, if we also update the mapping, we will see that all of a sudden, this virtual address that was first pointing to the word hello is now pointing to another location in memory, namely the page table. So we now have a buffer in our user space program um, which we can use to access a page table. And with access like this, we actually get read-write access to anywhere in memory. Because we can now modify mappings, we can change the page table whenever, any way we want, we can add new, uh, we, can, we can change entries, so we can change the second part of a buffer to point to somewhere else, or we can add new ones. Um, so with this, if you get this far, uh, then you have read-write access to anywhere in memory, right? And then uh, with that, we can actually get root access. The question, however, is how do we make sure that this page table will be stored here and not somewhere else in memory? Because we need it to be stored in a place where we can actually hammer it from two sides. And for this, we invented a new technique, which we call Fis Feng Shui. And I'm going to give you an intuition on how this works. Uh, so let's look at your physical memory. These are capacitors, uh, very small capacitors. And then you have some applications running on your device. They use some memory, the blue cells here. Uh, and then the first step of Fish Feng Shui is allocating large chunks of memory. In this case, we get two of those. And then we're going to search for bit flips. And then at some point, oh, I was supposed to do it like this. Yes. Some, at some point, we find a cell where we can flip a bit. Now, the next step is allocating smaller chunks in memory of a specific size. In this case, size 4. And we get all of these. Now, next, we release the, a small chunk that had the bit flip in it. And immediately afterwards, we're going to do this trick in our software to generate a new page table. And because in this scenario, we assume a page table has four, takes four cells to store, the operating system will have to put it over there, because all the other cells are in use, and there's simply no other place for it to store it. Um, and from here on now, we can do actually uh, hammer it again and flip a bit. Um, so this is probably hard to see. People always ask me, uh, what was this like if you were doing this? Well, I was looking at stuff like this, and this is not going to work. 
Uh, because there's a bit flip in here, you won't see it. It's there. No, you can, you can see it. <laughs> um, and then we did some evaluation, right? Because we wanted to know how many phones actually are vulnerable to this. Uh, so we had a lot of phones to play with. <clears throat> and we found, actually, that out of 27 devices, so we looked at 18 of them uh, had bit flips. Um, and interesting enough, sometimes you have a Nexus 5, a certain model. Uh, there were zero bit flips. And then you looked at the different Nexus 5, the so same model, uh, same manufacturer. It had close to a million bit flips. Um, sometimes, because not every bit flip is vulnerable, sometimes the first bit flip that you found that you could actually exploit, you find it after one second. Uh, but sometimes it would take 15 minutes to find your first exploitable bit flip. Um, in general, we did, some, we did some computation about this. We found that um, once you have the bit flip, it will take 22 more seconds at most to actually exploit your device. Um, then we wrote an app for this when we published the work. Uh, people could install our app. Uh, people trusted us to do this. And then we were seeing also bit flips on Google Pixel phones, uh, on OnePlus 3, um, I guess also OnePlus 5 these days. Uh, people were crazy enough to run this on the Galaxy Note 7. Um, <clears throat> and all these phones also had bit flips. So it turned out that this problem is pretty widespread. Um, disclosure then, which was very interesting, we contacted Google after we finished the exploit, and we suggested a list of mitigations. This was on July 25, 2016. Now, why is this date important? It is 91 days before we would go public with a paper. And Google has their own security team called Project Zero, and they give Google 90 days to fix stuff. So we gave them 91 days, which was like in time, right? They had enough time to fix it. Um, then at some point, we had a, a, a video call with these guys. And pretty, pretty soon, one of them said, yeah, can you maybe publish your work at another conference later this year? Uh, <laughs> well, of course not, because CCS is, of, is important for us. So that was a no. And then it was, yeah, what if we give you more, more money? <laughs> And then also, also no. And then the, 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 the I think this was most crazy was like, yeah, well, then maybe can you maybe obfuscate uh, some technical details of your paper so that other people cannot easily reproduce it anymore? That was, was also a no. And then we got, in the end, $4,000. It's an insane amount of money for an attack like this. Uh, <laughs> there were some uh, partial fixes in November, and then later on, they, they, they roll out some more fixes that should, fix, should stop it. Uh, I'm not sure it does, but uh, they say right now it works. And then um, this was this year, actually. We won a, a reward for this. So we won the Dutch Cyber Security Research Paper Award. And we got another 500 euros, which was later <laughs> doubled. We got another one. <laughs> So I guess the message here is, if you want to make money, you should go into research, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, And also, actually, so I just got back from, uh, from Black Hat uh, last week, and I won, the, I won the little pony over there, the pink one, for... Uh, <laughs> for best privilege escalation bug. Uh, so that was pretty cool. No money, of course. Um, in conclusion, now what, right? Um, we show in the last, uh, last year, 2016, we showed that you can use Rohammer to, to break all three major platforms, right? We can break your cloud, we can break the browser, and we can break your mobile phone. And it's important to know, yeah, we're also working on defenses so that you can actually uh, defend yourself against Rohammer. Um, but what we realized, what we must realize is that software was never really defined designed to deal with hardware issues, to hardware bit flips. And what we see so far is all, all defenses against attack like this, uh, they're still in early stages, and right now also easily bypassed. And even, uh, as we were also seeing right now, is that hardware mitigations that have been designed and proposed, they're still optional. So not everybody um, may use this. And also, lastly, you cannot fix Rohammer. Right? So you cannot 
open your phone and then take out a memory and then try to solder it a little bit and then put it back in and then hope that your uh, raw armor problem is gone. It's not possible. Um, so yeah, raw armor, is it maybe the silent killer since 2010? Um, we saw that uh, a lot of DRAM chips that have been manufactured since are vulnerable for this. And 83% of the DD3, DDR3 modules in some study, um, with 83% of them affected, this really is an issue. Uh, we think that more research is necessary to understand what's going on. Um, also, it's not going away. So with bitflips on the pixel, other people reporting bitflips on DDR4, um, we are going to see raw uh, research and attack and defenses for quite some more time. So what's next? Uh, question yourself, do you still trust your hardware? And will there be a Roamer 2.0? That's it. Um, you can find more details, demos. Actually, do we, have, do we have time? How much time do we have? We wanted minutes. to show a demo. Um, I think I have it open. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Oh, there's a lot of time for Q&A. <laughs> or we can do another video. Oh, and 10? Oh, OK. OK. <laughs> Um, oh. Wow. Does it work? Yes, it works. So it's a bit hard to tell, I guess. Um, I'm losing the Dremor exploit here. Uh, at first, I'm trying to run SU, so I'm trying to uh, get root privileges. And then I'm calling ex the exploit. And here it is searching for bit flips. It finds a couple, but not all of them are usable. And then here it's uh, launching the second part of the attack. It must be very hard to read. Um, but actually, already here, we have access to kernel memory. And I, right now, we are scanning it. And then we found some structures. And then it turned out that we're not. So we, we, we found the CPU, uh, the, the user ID our own user ID. And we override it with zero, and then we check whether we are actually uh, also root. And then it turned out we were not overriding our own structure, so maybe we were uh, giving somebody else root access. And then in the end, we get a shell, and we are root. And this was on Android 6.0.1, which was at the time the latest uh, Android version. I think this would be it. Yes. So do you want to do another demo? Do you guys want to see another demo? <laughs> <laughs> OK. You have to do it, though. Which okay. one? Um, the uh, let's do SSH. Is it Fip Feng Shui? Yeah. This one? This one? Yeah. Does it work? Can we, yeah. Like this? Oh, yeah, it's five minutes. Good. All right. So we have two screens here. Uh, so the, let me try to remember. Yes, the, le <laughs> <laughs> the left one is the, uh, uh, the sort of like, I think the, um, uh, sort of like gives you a log of um, what is going on. So it's basically we wrote uh, sort of like an exploit that launches every time it creates, you know, two new VMs. <coughs> and. Um, and then one is the attacker and one is the victim. The attacker doesn't know the uh, private key of the victim. And then it tries to so like do the flip feng shui attack to trigger a bit flip in the RSA uh, public key of the victim. And then um, tries to generate a new private key and log in. On the right side, so we have a, uh, so the thing is that once we do a bit flip, we still have to factorize. Uh, so like we have to uh, factorize the RSA, the corrupted public RSA key, to be able to generate the private key. And for this, we need lots of computation power. So we have a cluster uh, at our university uh, that uh, we use for like, so here you can see that we have uh, 256 cores. And uh, we're so like, uh, like bootstrapping a new uh, factorization process. So once we find the bit flip, right, we want to check it on the public key to see whether we can factorize it or not. 
And then, so on the right side, we start looking, and then as soon as we find one, one bit flip that allows us to do the factorization, then we know, okay, this is the bit flip that we want. And then we choose that, and then we, so like that page, that physical page, we put, uh, so like the public key that we, uh, the, the, of the victim there, the memory duplication in the background, uh, like basically um, updates the, the so like pointers of the victim to point to this page, and then we trigger the bit flip, and this corrupts the, uh, the, the so like the VM's uh, public key. Uh, and then we already have the factors because the cluster have given us the, the so like the factors. We generate the private key and then we log in. Um, all right, so I'm gonna we're gonna go through this quickly, I guess. So here we are, like starting the VMs. I'm gonna get out of the way. This is really a slow, but you asked for it, so you have to watch, watch through. <laughs> what is it doing? Uh, it's now starting the VMs. Oh, it's starting up, so. Yeah, so ah. this is the, so like the public modulus of the, the, so like the victim. And uh, so it's waiting, it's bootstrapping, it's networking, uh, so like it could talk with, with them. Developing this was really painful, like it took us like weeks <laughs> because we had to wait every time. And so here's the so like IP address of the, uh, so now the attack VM is uh, ready. So we SSH to the victim to make sure that it's page, uh, so like with, a, with an invalid username so that we make sure that the public key is brought into, into memory. And um, as, at this point, we start like scanning uh, for, for bit flips. And there, on the right side, you can see that, you know, because these are valid bit flips, we start looking, we add them to our cluster, and we start looking for one that is, uh, basically, we can factor. So we use the ECM, which is a known um, factorization algorithm for this, which works quite well for, uh, for our situation. Yeah, so now we found the factorization. So basically, one of our uh, processes came back. We said, if you do this bit flip, here will be the, the sort of like the, uh, the, the factors for this. And now we're going to wait for memory deduplication in the background. So we put the public key in there, and we're waiting for the memory deduplication process to actually you know, merge the pages in the background. Is this the music from the video? Sorry? The, yeah, there is, a, there is a music. So here we are actually looking from the outside when the deduplication happens, but in a, in a real world, the attacker could use the deduplication side channel to figure out when the deduplication has happened, or just wait 10 minutes, you know? So that's so like uh, what we are doing here. So we want, to be, uh, we want to check that indeed the deduplication has happened. Should be okay. <laughs> All right, the end is really quick. <laughs> yeah, so most of the time is basically spent looking for bit flips and waiting for the duplication to actually, you know, merge the pages. But the actual attack itself happens really quickly.
I wonder if it's going to work. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's taking too long, man. <laughs> it's not going to work. All right. Uh, so now the duplication actually happened. So uh, we're talking with the you know exploit uh, instance running in the in the in the attacker. Um, uh, we basically, so we waited so long for this duplication to happen for this, right? <laughs> so <laughs> where uh, basically uh, once it, is, uh, it happened, we basically corrupt it, and then um, it gives us the command that you can try to log in with this new private key. And here you can see that actually with this new uh, private key, we could actually log in. And yeah, so that was it. So this is uh, sort of like how it looks like if you're doing it. Thank you. No. There is a part two to this? <laughs> no. Oh. Oh. Yes. Uh, let's go back here. Because, yeah, that was it. Um, I think hopefully we have some time for questions. If not, then you can always go to our website or contact us on Twitter. Yeah, you can download the website, the, the app, if you trust us, if you trust Worthy. Yeah. You can download the, the app to test your mobile device. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you so much for this fascinating research and presentation you just gave. We do have time for a QA. Um, yeah, but first, yeah, please give <laughs> another big round of applause for this awesome research. Uh, maybe, <clears throat> sorry, maybe a bit of a dumb question, uh, but please bear with me for a second. So if, if Rohammer flips the bit, why doesn't the error correcting hardware in the RAM take care of that? Yeah, well, uh, because many times there is no error correcting code in the, in the RAM. <laughs> so of course, you, uh, you're probably uh, referring to our ECC, which uh, usually the server should have, um, and then it should stop the, um, the flip fixture attack for the cloud would be, would be most hard, because if you have ECC there, it would be harder. Um, <clears throat> but for your normal desktop computer or your laptop, usually doesn't have ECC. Same for mobile. So. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was really good. Um, couldn't a possible solution software side would be to hold a private key for the SSH server in multiple locations in the in memory and check from multiple locations so that if you have a bit flip at one point, you need to have the coincidence of having it at two points. So you mean the public key? Uh, yeah, sorry, the public yeah. key. So that's, that's a possibility. So uh, perhaps uh, like a slightly like, um, better way of doing it would be to keep like an uh, integrity check of the public key. And every, t every time you want to use it, you check whether the integrity a hash that you make out of your public keys is still the same. We proposed this, but uh, so uh, the OpenGPG guys, Open, they, they did something like this, so they added the integrity check for this. But the SSH guys, uh, Theo the Rat is not uh, the nicest guy. <laughs> to talk. He, also, he had concerns for backward compatibility because once you have like uh, SSH versions that don't support this, then uh, it would it would be problematic. So, but yes, something some software solution like this would protect against attack. Don't have to. You don't trust your hardware, that's the... That's yeah, so don't trust your memory, that's the, sort of like, uh, the message. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Uh, so, when your paper first came out, uh, my, my compliments for that, I was really impressed. And secondly, I started thinking of defending, because that's what I, what I really like to do as well. Uh, it's the other side of attacking. And, and I tried to look at, on the, on the host side, what are the, 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 the side channel signals which can uh, help me detect a row hammer attack? So I tried detecting changes in my cache, of course, because if I, I try to write uh, stuff to memory and time how long it took to get back, because if you get, if you get it from cache, it will come back quicker. If your cache is empty because of hammering, uh, it comes back slower. So I tried to get a valid measurement. I couldn't find one. Do you have any theories where, where such a detection would, would, could be developed? Yeah. No, he was talking about the host, so that's your, that's your domain. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is a defense already out there. It's called Anvil. It looks at the um, performance counters in your processors to see whether you're getting too many cache misses and uses this as a metric to decide that hammering is going on. 
and then uh, refreshes the memory by uh, accessing those rows that might be affected by this. So there is already something going on, but it wouldn't work on ARM because we don't have those performance counters. Yeah, that's, that's why I didn't focus on ARM. I yeah. couldn't figure out how, how to go that way. Thanks. Yeah. 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 Has there been any cases of this attack actually being used in the wild? Because um, it seems to me that uh, there are lots of, uh, lots of unknowns, like you could use it to root your own phone, or you could use it to, say, compromise a smart card where you can run software. Uh, but uh, there would be too many unknowns to actually use it against a random target in the wild, like, uh, say, a, a non-targeted browser exploitation. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree. It would be very hard to do this uh, in a wild. So we haven't seen it. Um, I guess people are trying to implement the Dremor attack through their own phone, because if you have access to it yourself, then it might be easier. But still, it's, yeah, it's hard to uh, set this up and pull it off. That's true. Yeah, so the, especially the D2S Machina, uh, I think that's so like quite dangerous because uh, you could basically just rent uh, advertisement companies to basically send your JavaScript to people. But hopefully it took Eric, who's a very, very smart guy, a very long time to implement this attack. So I'm kind of hoping that you know, it would take a long time and by then hopefully we will have like harder mitigations in place. As to the uh, hardware deduplication attack factor, you mentioned uh, that it's done per page, and uh, the portion of the memory you're interested in is, is much smaller than that. Can you maybe elaborate on uh, uh, how you get an entire page to be identical to the, uh, the target? That's a very good question. Uh, so the things that we rely on, so when we read this file, it ends up being in the page cache, which is like this uh, sort of cache that, uh, so Linux or maybe Windows also, yeah, keeps to so like make sure that most of your accesses are served from memory, not disk, because memory is fast, disk is slow. So and we are targeting that cache, which so like is page, so it's page based. And then whenever you read this file, basically puts it in that page. So it has to allocate one page. So even if the file is smaller than a page, it still allocates one page. And then the rest of the bytes are zero. And this so like uh, allows us to get an exact match basically. So that's so like how it works with uh, flip entry. Hi, thanks. Have you seen any efforts trying can, to implement... Can you please try to speak a bit more into the mic? Have you seen any efforts trying to implement this on an iPhone for jailbreaking, for example? I haven't seen it. We briefly looked at it, um, but it was not very straightforward to get uh, direct memory access. So we couldn't actually uh, hammer and search for bit tips. I'm pretty sure it uh, should be possible, um, but so far there are no... No result, no report of flips on iPhone. Yeah, we would love somebody to do it. So. <laughs> Get lots of money from Apple if you do it. <laughs> is this ever likely to occur in the real world as a non-intentional attack just to say a particular usage pattern of, of computers? Can you please repeat the question? Is this ever happened, likely to happen in the real world as a non-intentional attack, just as a normal software bug? Um, so actually, uh, so I think when it was first reported, there was this guy who was working on this uh, encoding libraries, uh, encoding decoding libraries for uh, so like a video, and then he was getting so he was sure that his software was correct, but uh, most of the times he was getting like sometimes like random corruptions, and it was a single threaded program, so he was like really really baffled by why this is happening, and then once this error was reported, he was saying that it was very very much likely uh, because of this. So yeah, indeed there are cases in the real world that. There are certain access, but it doesn't happen too often, but you, if you do things like apparently encoding and decoding in a certain way, it could cause this pattern specifically that would cause bits to flip. Um, have you tried the bit flipping also on ECDSA keys rather than RSA? Uh, we have not tried it, but it's interesting. Yes, I think it, there may be like a potential. So the thing is that it should be something that people use. Uh, if people are using it, we think that it's an interesting uh, target. So the other thing that we would like people to do to start thinking about, so because this attack, uh, the Flip Shui attack targets crypto, uh, so we think that there should be a little bit more on the crypto side to start protecting against these kinds of attacks. So we are hoping that, I'm not a cryptographer, I don't think Victor is a cryptographer, we, we would like cryptographers to also look at this, because it seems like these kind of errors are not going away. And cryptographic, uh, so like data seems to be a good target, so there should be more protection. Indeed, that's a good question. Thank you very much for the questions. To be on time for the next talk, which is going to be My Safe is Your House at 14.30.
Uh, we are going uh, to close down Q&A now, but Victor and Café will be available if you have more questions or just want to pet the pony um, after the talk. <laughs> Thank you again, and another warm round of applause for Victor and Café.